Well, good evening. Yes, it is sparse tonight. We know that the Gumperts are out visiting, and also the Chris and Crystal are, are visiting Rowlett, and so uh, we sure miss them. When, when we have just a few missing, we surely feel it, and uh, we're, we're glad we're, all of us are here tonight to worship the Father. And tonight, as uh, I'd like to continue on with the thoughts uh, we had this morning regarding uh, uh, the title this morning was that you may grow thereby, but tonight I'd like to look at problems faced by the new convert. You know, we looked at this morning how one's life has changed, his focus has changed, his mindset, his activities, and his obligations don't change when he becomes a Christian, and it's a lifelong commitment. It's something that we don't just do for a little while and stop, and that's the thing that many, many people obey the gospel become Christians. At first, they are enthusiastic, full of zeal, but then it begins to wane because of various reasons. I'd like to look at some of these reasons and uh, things that we can do to overcome that. You know, the, the, the fact that there is religious prejudice, that's one thing that would, would, uh, a new convert would face. Uh, and it, was, it happened in the New Testament just as much as it happens today. You know, we think about our commitment to the Lord should be greater than that. Our, our, uh, our love for Christ should be greater than that of our family. Now, as when one obeys the gospel and becomes a Christian, uh, family becomes very important. Our love for our God follows with our love for our fellow man, and it follows with the love for our family as well. But unfortunately, there are problems that when a new convert would face from his family. Family rejection. You know, no matter how hard a new convert may have tried, their family members seem not to be moved at all. You know, if you've, and this is particularly uh, uh, pertinent to uh, those who have not grown up in a family who are Christians, whose family, uh, like perhaps denominational background or no, no religious background at all, after obeying the gospel, they, well, well, their family don't re, does not relate to uh, the commitment they've made. Whereas uh, uh, people who grew up in the in the Church of Christ, they grew up with the sound doctrine, the teachings, and so they don't experience that same thing. But as uh, one who may have obeyed the gospel, their family will not understand. Not only are they not moved by the bare truth revealed but before their very eyes, that of reading the scriptures. Uh, but they seem to be unimpressed because, well, they don't really give me the respect that I believe I deserve. Uh, as a, you know, a, you know, Jesus said that a, a prophet is not given uh, honor in his own, own home. And so it was that Jesus fully expected not to receive any recognition in his hometown or his, his uh, home area. Um, they don't perceive uh, me as a bearer of truth. If I were to be, obey the, well, I have. But, you know, if you were to try to talk to your family, they seem to be, do not perceive me as a bearer of truth, but rather, well, that's good old Curtis, our little brother or son or cousin or whatever the relation is. And uh, this lukewarm response can be rather discouraging, uh, particularly from your own family. Um, and from Luke 4, 7, verses 17 through 24 is the account where Jesus goes to, to uh, and reads in the synagogue and, uh, and that, that uh, he makes the, the point that, that no prophet is accepted in his own country. In uh, Luke 4, 24, and he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Um, that's one problem that uh, amongst his family, amongst his friends, they don't really see the value of the, the decision that the, that young Christian has made. And so they, they tend to be cold toward that or lukewarm or just uh, they don't perceive the value of the message that, that uh, this young Christian might be trying to bring to them. You know, there are also hypocrites within the church. We know there were hypocrites among the Pharisees, uh, among the scribes. And, and in fact, Jesus pronounced that woe unto them in, in chapter 23 of Matthew. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And he proceeded to... Uh, 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 rail against them because they had uh, so many instances and inconsistencies where they evidenced their hypocrisy and their religious views. Well, there are hypocrites in the church too, unfortunately. Rather than encouraging the zeal of a new convert to go out and share the gospel with others, they discourage them with uh, various things uh, such as, you need to know more. You don't know enough yet. You know, so, so before you go out and talking to people, just, just settle down a little bit and you need to know more from the scriptures, or you need to learn some more about our system or technique in, in saving souls. And so they pretty much are uh, 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 
cooling down any zeal that a young Christian might have. And as they, they rather than uh, uh, being encouraged to, yes, this is what we're supposed to be doing, involved in, in reaching any of your friends, even your, any of your family, we ought to be doing this. They're trying, no, no, don't be too excited about all this. And so that's rather discouraging. And they soon learn that there are some within the church that really do not care for the lost and dying souls. That really is the case. And last week I spoke about people who are lost really are lost. The fact that uh, uh, we are, there are so many that are not concerned about that. Well, I've, got my, I've, I've heard the gospel. I've obeyed the gospel. I've got my salvation. Well, really? Are you sure about that? Because with that, in our obedience to the gospel, our service to the Lord, it involves reaching out and, and uh, spreading the gospel where we can. Um, and soon the religious zeal cools of, of that young convert. They just get the idea if they just join the club. You know, uh, the, it's, it's like so many people pe- play religion. They show up at, at church on Sundays, and, and, you know, and, and it really does not affect their lives personally and the things they do uh, and, and the people they talk to. And they certainly like, they view it as like joining a club. They lose their hunger to save lost souls. New converts also discover that some Christians uh, that curse, they're involved with social drinking, involved with gambling, smoking, dancing, and the social, that is, you know, dancing in the social setting. They never study. They hear slandering the brethren, that they like elders and preachers, you know, they're always talking bad about their brethren and numerous other sins, what folks like to regard as vices sometimes. And so as, as they see their people who, have obeyed the gospel in Christians, and they see that, well, they're doing things just like everybody else. How discouraged can that be? You know, Galatians 5, 19 through 21 shows that the, the works of the flesh, those who are involved with that, shall not inherit eternal life. They will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. In Galatians 5, 19, uh, Paul enumerates things. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variants, emulations, and wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Let me take a breath. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You know, it's, it's, this is just not a full list, and yet this list is so long. I mean, and, and you think that all these things that the, the, these people are involved with, the revelings, and such like, not just these things, but everything like them, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Anyone who is involved with this shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They, they're involved with it. They continue involved with it. They don't repent. They don't turn back. They're not ashamed. They continue in the world just like as though they were never baptized, just as though they really are not Christians. And yes, these are, these are uh, men and women who have obeyed the gospel but have either have continued in, in the sins they used to live in or have, gone, have turned toward those things. And uh, sorry to say, even those who obey the gospel, if they're involved with this, they lose their soul. And so as a young Christian who witnesses these things, they see the hypocrisy, they see those that their lives have changed or are any different from those in the world. And so how discouraging can that be in losing one's zeal for serving the Lord? The best advice regarding this is keep your mind on Christ and keep from scrutinizing others. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 12. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. When, when a young Christian or an old Christian runs across this, uh, of course, our concern for their souls is real. And, if, and uh, as a young Christian, he would probably want to seek the advice of, of uh, perhaps the elders or uh, more mature, experienced Christian, but as we look in uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Paul makes a statement that uh, he says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that compare, uh, commend themselves, but they, measure, they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. So they are not looking toward that goal in heaven. They are not looking toward that that, that uh, um the best example, our Savior, Jesus Christ, okay, as the one to emulate. And so they compare themselves among themselves. Say, I'm not so bad. I'm doing what everybody else is doing. You know? and, 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 
And as they compare, those Christians who are involved in those things, as they compare themselves among other Christians who are involved in this thing, I'm not so bad. Well, it's easy when you're comparing that way. But Paul says, we're not foolish enough to compare ourselves like that. When we look at ourselves, and we need to compare our lives with that of Christ as our example. And so, unfortunately, the young Christian who sees this, the, the best advice for that would simply be, you look to Christ as your example. You don't compare yourself with your fellow Christians. Rather, compare yourself with the, the, the right pattern, the right standard. Um, Also, another aspect of, of things that, and you're, you're seeing that these are things that are actually within the church. The, uh, the, the, those Christians who have turned themselves toward the ways of the world, and they don't repent, and they don't see their lives as, they don't see their souls as being in peril. And that, that's within the church. But also the insensities, insensitivities, I should say, of some fellow Christians. Insensitivities, what do I mean? Well, they're quick to criticism of prayers or led by new converts or without any allowance for ignorance or on the part of new converts. When I say ignorance, I don't mean stupidity. I mean simply they haven't learned some things yet. And so we allow for growth. As Christians, we, we, we understand you're not perfect all at once. It takes time to develop and to learn, have greater understanding, to develop your abilities as one leads in prayers. To, to criticize a young Christian because he didn't word the prayer just right. You know, that's happened before. That has happened before. And rather than encouraging zeal, it discourages the young convert or, or that, that, you know, why try? I, and it's so insensitive for a more mature Christian to criticize in that way. Or consider uh, uh, one who has just obeyed the gospel, a young lady who has just obeyed the gospel, coming out of the world, okay, in in. Even all their fashions are still fashioned after what they have used to in the world, and they don't perceive a number of things yet. And so, as for instance, there's a, I know of one instance when a sister in Christ, uh, she jumped on a new convert for giving thanks uh, on the Lord's table for just, I'm sorry, rather, for a, one who's leading a prayer, that is, giving thanks for the Lord's table for Jesus' body, which is broken for us. Well, this, this young, one young Christian, not a woman, a man, but uh, he was, he was uh, uh, I guess you could say, rebuked for, by this uh, older Christian woman because he used the phrase, broke the bo thanking God for the, the sacrifice of his, broken bo his body that was broken for us. Well, for, first of all, it was rather insensitive to jump down this, this young man's throat about this wording of this, this prayer, you know, if he, he's developing his skills, abilities, and, and, and leading these prayers. And, and uh, so the, to just jump all over him is so insensitive. But also the fact that this woman that showed her ignorance herself of not realizing that in 1 Corinthians, um, the, uh, the passage is 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, where it discusses the, use, the, the fact that his body was broken for us. Now, other versions do not have this phrase. But the fact is, the King James Version does. And that, so it, in that sense, it was a scriptural phrase. Not that any bone in his body was not broken. That's not what, the, what it's saying. And, and unfortunately, when that phrase is used, they think, well, the scriptures say no bone in his body was broken. And they weren't. But that's not what he's saying. His body was broken in the sense it doesn't, didn't any longer function. It didn't, it's not talking about his bones. So that's an example where an older, more mature Christian uh, 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 criticizing this, this young man for using this phrase, which was scriptural, and, and that's rather insensitive. Or how about the young lady who has, uh, I heard an account of a young sister who blasted a teenage girl for immodest apparel. She had just been baptized that Wednesday night, and this was her first service which she attended. She was baptized on Wednesday night, and she went to the service on Wednesday night, and like I said, her, she wasn't quite aware of all the things that, that uh, more mature Christians are about things like uh, modesty, the way we dress. And she was, she was jumped all over because she was too revealing. Well, I understand that, that, but with teaching, taking one aside and teaching, rather than jumping down their throat, that's, uh, and so as we consider, we should be sensitive toward the younger brethren. And, and unfortunately, one of the things that young Christians face is that some of the brethren really are insensitive to their situation, that they need to learn, they need to develop, 
And nothing's worse to break the zeal of a person, break the spirit of one, than just criticism and, and, and of that nature. Now, in time, one should understand, of course. We know that. In time, as we, we grow in, the, in, the, in, the, in learning, in the, uh, uh, we should be aware of these things. And so we do uh, uh, edit what we say. You know? We do watch what we wear for, in concern for our fellow brethren. Okay? And uh, we watch what we say. And, and, uh, and so we're, we're more sensitive to that. But that's given in time. So we need to understand for the young Christian, not everything is evident. And so those are just a couple of things that a young Christian might face and could, could uh, thwart their zeal, cool their, their uh, heated fervor for serving the Lord. And you know, uh, in all of that, I think that we make a grave mistake in trying to, in cooling people's zeal for serving the Lord. Um, we should encourage uh, people who want to get involved with saving the lost, talking to people. Uh, rather than discouraging it. And, uh, um, and when, we, when we, of course, as other things are discussed, they're dealt with so that we know how to behave ourselves in the house of the Lord, but we need to never break the spirit or cool the zeal of a young Christian who wants to serve the Lord, and in, in whether it be evangelism, you know, reaching out, spreading the gospel, handing out tracts, inviting people to Bible classes, um, even private studies. We should never discourage that. Rather, we should encourage that. As a matter of fact, I would not doubt that the zeal of a new, uh, newborn Christian, that is, newborn again Christian, that is, one who's obeyed the gospel, I wouldn't doubt that that one zeal would be a convicting influence upon the older, more mature Christian who has not been involved in any evangelism for years. And that might be a motivation for one to lash out at his young Christian. Okay. Um, so, as we consider the, the, the various obstacles that a young Christian comes from, his family, his friends, even from within the, bre the, the household of God, that, uh, that uh, as young Christians, do not be discouraged, but rather be uh, continuing your zeal and, and desire to serve the Lord, um, and, and don't let the more mature, so to speak, discourage you. Okay. Uh, new converts are obligated to live a new life and think a new way. We discussed that this morning. They, they, we, we are to walk in the light. We are to think in a new way, think on pure things. We put away that old man of sin and, and, uh, and put on that new man that was raised from that watery grave of baptism. In Romans 6, 4, it, to rep repeat what we've gone over this morning, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And of course, 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire to sinful, sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. New converts or any Christian are encouraged to grow by familiarizing himself by learning and studying the Word of God. And, and the natural uh, consequences of that in studying and learning is spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, one thing to know why, why, in the, why does the Christian grow in the sense that we know that one who studies the Scripture will consequently grow spiritually. But but um, what is the reasoning? What is the motivation that a Christian would want to grow? Well, there are some wrong ideas about spiritual growth. There are some wrong ideas I'd like to talk about right now. There's the idea of what's called progressive sanctification or perfection. As one grows in Christianity, one, who, one might get the idea that he is perfect becoming more a more perfect Christian and that as he goes on day by day growing in the knowledge of the Lord that he will be more favorable for to entering into heaven he becomes a more perfect Christian he becomes a Christian Christian as it were or a better Christian um, um, but uh, as they become better Christians, they will be more ready for heaven than they were when they were baptized. That's the idea that, that one might have in his head. 
after hearing a number of sermons about the ideal word of God, you know, what, we, what is our goal that we want to achieve, um, that one may conclude that they will never be perfect enough to go to heaven. Does they quit the church? It's true. We'll never be perfect enough to go to heaven. That's not the point. That's, it's, it's not the idea that we perfect ourselves to where we are worthy of entering to heaven. That's not the case. That's not the point. Those who obey the gospel, and as soon as they come up out of that water, they're Christians, and they have that inheritance in heaven. It's the same inheritance that a, a mature Christian who's been baptized 30 years ago who will enter in that heaven. They both inherit the same thing. You recall the parable of the husbandman that had a field and he went out to find workers and at the beginning of the day he found a number of workers to work his field and then a few hours later he goes out and finds some more workers and hires them and, and they, uh, they go to work in his field. And this, he went to four different groups of men to hire them to go to work in his field and it came time that the day was over. It came time to receive their pay for the day's work, and lo, they come, and the, the, uh, the owner of that field, the husbandman, that he had agreed to a certain pay for all of them, and as the first ones, the, the last ones he had hired come up, they get their pay exactly as they thought, as they had agreed. And that happened to be the same pay that the first ones he had hired were going to receive. And so the first ones, as they witnessed this, they thought, well, surely we'll get more because we worked harder and longer in the field. And as they came to receive their, their uh, just pay, according to their agreement, the, the landowner handed them the pay that they agreed for. And they were saying, well, what's this? And the landowner said, did we not agree for that? Well, the idea is that those who have been working in the vineyard of the Lord from the very beginning or from later on, all will receive the same reward in heaven. That is, they shall all re uh, enter into heaven. Now we, we know that Paul has discussed that the crown of righteousness he shall receive, but all, not him, but all those who love the coming of the Lord, the appearing of the Lord. And so uh, there, there will be those that who will be uh, rewarded based on the fruits of their labors, if they've been able to withstand the test. And, uh, but whether or not they, they, like for instance, Paul was involved with establishing a lot of different congregations. Many missionaries involved today with establishing congregations all over the world. People in America, in whatever country they are, they're establishing congregations of the Lord's church. And how long will that, that congregation stand? I don't know. If it stands for 100 years uh, you know, or, or just a couple of years, the, the reward will be based on the fruits of their labor. How that, that the fruits of their labor, labor stand. And they shall receive that crown. But those who, whose fruits dwindled, withered, didn't, didn't stand the test, they'll still receive the reward in heaven. They'll still receive that, that uh, promise of everlasting home in heaven. Um, so as we consider uh, the, progressive, the progressive sanctification, the idea that we perfect ourselves become, or we become more worthy into, to enter into heaven is false. Um, growing in Christ is not necessarily connected to the fact that one is a Christian. It's not a given that when one becomes a Christian that he will grow. One has to apply himself to put forth the effort to study the scriptures and think about what it is said, and just learning the knowledge is not enough either. It is applying it, putting it into application, making it a part of your actual daily life, and not just head knowledge. Um, um, one who has just been baptized died immediately, say, upon his rising from the water grave, he'd go to the same heaven as the one who died, de uh, who died decades later after being immersed. You know, and, and I've discussed the householder hiring the laborers. A newborn Christian is a Christian. He shall receive the reward. In Colossians 2.10, and ye are complete in him. Who? Christians. What Christians? All Christians, all who obey the gospel, are complete in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. This is discussing that how one who obeys the gospel immediately, he's a, he's a, a full-fledged member, as it were, you know, and put it in a manner of speaking, that... Uh, He's as much a Christian as, as the one who's baptized 20 years ago and shall receive the same reward in heaven, that's, that is, shall enter into heaven just like uh, any others, okay? 
One who dedicates himself in Christ is not trying to be a Christian Christian or better than a Christian, but rather he's just wanting to grow in the faith. Growing in Christ is not necessarily related to God's love. What does that mean? We, we know that we talk about unconditional love. And yes, God's love is unconditional. He sent his son to die upon the cross for everyone, to die for the sins of the whole world. His love is unconditional. Romans 5, 8, uh, for God committed his love toward us, and yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for the ungodly. So, so that uh, his love is unconditional, but the, the, the uh, uh, forgiveness of sins is conditional. That's dependent upon our faith and what it motivates us to do. Do we reject the message? Do we reject the obedience? Or do we, are we motivated because we love God so much that we'll be baptized and motivated that because he has saved us, we will grow in the faith. Um, can you imagine a young mother who sincerely teaches her child by saying that if a child will obey her, then mommy will love you. What is that mother saying? If you obey me, mommy will love you. It's conditional. If you do what I say, then I'm going to love you. That's not what God's love is all about. Okay? God loves all men, whether or not they obey him. Now, if they obey him, they receive the, the, uh, re, the, the uh, forgiveness of sins. But yet, if they reject him, of course, they stand to be condemned in, in uh, the day of judgment. Um, what's, so as we consider what is being taught when that mother says, if you, if you obey me, I'll love you, other than my love is conditional upon how I behave, you know. We all understand that the parent will continue to love the child, regardless of the behavior of the child. So is the love of our Father in heaven. In Romans 5, 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. There was nothing we could do, no strength. We didn't have any ability to save ourselves. And so while we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, um, for scarcely, for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we do not strive to grow spiritually in an effort to earn more of God's love. It's important to understand that. We don't grow in the faith in order to receive more of God's love. God loves us regardless. It is by misunderstanding that one would even say, I don't feel good enough to go into heaven. How we feel, uh, I'm sure it has some bearing upon how, um, uh, our relationship with God. But you know, the, we, we are saved not because, by the way we feel. We're saved because of what we have done, what we believed, and what we have been motivated to do. If we have obeyed God, then he will keep his promise to save us. If we confess our sins to God, he's faithful to forgive us. Okay, And so... Uh, so we must understand that we don't earn God's love by being more and more righteous or growing more and more in knowledge. You know, growing in Christ is not necessarily related to Bible knowledge. You know, higher critics have a lot of Bible knowledge, yet are not even close to obeying what they read. Think about that. The higher critics also uh, term the destructive critics, those who, who look at the scriptures and analyze it, and they say, well, the genuineness of this text is not, is not really genuine. And they, don't, and, they, and they say, well, this has been redacted, this has been uh, added to, this is put together. And so they try to come up with all these uh, 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 analytical uh, suppositions and what they view the scriptures to be, and all it does is tear down people's faith in the scriptures. And they have a lot of knowledge about scriptures, about the original texts and all, but that knowledge does not lead them to salvation. That knowledge does not lead them to the true knowledge and power of God, as I said this morning, uh, uh, Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and also the Greek. God's power to save is in the gospel, but if you don't act upon what, if you don't believe that this is what I need to do, you, you have all the knowledge about it, but you don't believe it and that drives you to do it, then you don't learn the power of God. You know, there, there was a uh, there was a fellow by the name of Nietzsche, I think his name is pronounced. It's N-E-I-T-Z-S-H-E. He's a philosopher of the 19th century, 
and he urged Christians to give up Christ and return to the pagan virtues of Greek civilization, if there were any virtue in Greek civilization, in, in the pagan the, the religions. And that's what he was trying to convince the Christians to return to the classical Greek civilization. He was challenged into, in a debate concerning the Bible as God's word by a Baptist preacher. Rightly so. This man was pr uh, spreading false teaching that there was virtue in the Greek civilization, the Greek pagan religions and the Greek civilizations. And so he was challenged to a debate by a Baptist preacher. Well, uh, this, uh, he wrote the preacher a letter asking the denominational preacher if he believed that baptism was for the remission of sins. It was for the purpose of being, his sins being forgiven. Well, uh, if you're familiar with the Baptist doctrine, you, you may be aware that Baptists don't believe that ba baptism is for the purpose of remission of sins. They believe it's because they have already been forgiven that they're baptized. Okay. Well, the fact is the Bible teaches that we are forgiven for the purpose, that is, we are baptized for the purpose of receiving forgiveness of sins. And as he was asked, do you believe that this is for the remission of sins? Well, the reply was, no, he did not. He didn't believe that that was the case. Well, this is the response. Nietzsche then concluded that there was no need for debate, for you do not believe the Bible any more than I do. That's a valid conclusion, isn't it? If one who looks at and sees clearly what the Bible says and rejects what it says, he doesn't believe the Bible any more than an atheist. Not at all. And, and so it was, uh, as we discuss about the knowledge of the Bible, does not necessarily cause one's faith to grow. Um, if we may grow in knowledge of the Bible, but unless we have a mind to do it, we will never grow in Christ. As James wrote, you know, a man who looks in the mirror and then walks away forgetting what he is. It's like the man who hears the perfect law of liberty. And he hears what it says, but he makes no adjustments to his own life. And so that's, as we study and grow in knowledge of the scriptures, we need to understand, we need to apply it if we're going to, to uh, grow in the faith. So why then are Christians, both old and new, to encouraged to grow in grace and knowledge? Why are we encouraged to go, grow in grace and knowledge? It really does improve one's relationship with God and with man. You think about, as our knowledge grows about our Savior and our knowledge grows about God, our relationship can get very, uh, with God can be improved and with our fellow man can be improved because it teaches us to love our fellow man. It teaches us to love God. And it teaches us about genuineness, purity of heart. As we confess our love to God, you know, as we, as we pray to God, don't we praise him? Don't we tell him how wonderful he is and how grateful we are that he thought enough of us to send his son to die for us? And, and, and does that knowledge not cause our relationship with him to grow closer? But it doesn't always happen that way. But uh, uh, so that uh, the motivation is not to gain more of heaven. Our motivation to, to grow in grace and knowledge is not to gain more of heaven. That's not really what it is. In first, Second Peter 3.18, uh, Peter writes, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. So as one grows in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, glory is given to the Father. Giving glory to God is all that God's creation is about. Consider Isaiah 42.8. Isaiah 42, 8, which says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. God deserves glory, honor, worship. Isaiah 40, verse 18, To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? There's nothing to compare to God. God is preeminent. He's the all in all. Um, uh, um, Revelation 4, 11, the praises as John was witnessing these events that he, that he was allowed to see, and there, there was the, the angels proclaiming, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Again, Isaiah 43, 7, Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, Yea, I have made him. So God has made us for his glory. 
In his first epistle, John puts it as these, clarifying that we will never reach sinless perfection. 1 John 1, verses 7 through 10. We will never reach sinless perfection because we know that the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us. It doesn't cleanse us once, and that's all. But rather, as we continue to confess our sins to God, as we do that again and again and again, as we sin, God is faithful to forgive us again and again and again as we confess our sins to him. What does that imply? The fact that God, Christ's blood continues to cleanse us, that as we continue to confess and God continues to forgive us, the implication is very clear. We should infer correctly that we continue to sin. Not purposely, but we do sin. So if we say that we have no sin, we make God to be a liar. And God, we do not have God in us. The Father is not in us. So uh, we, we must understand a Christian through his spiritual growth and more closely walking with the Lord can glorify his Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. What's the result of that? When they see your good works, oh, look what a good fellow he is. No, that, we, that, uh, we, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So when we recognize that growth in the Christian faith is about glorifying the Father in heaven and not as a perfectionism, then we are more likely to remain faithful. We understand our salvation, it's uh, directly related to our faith and our faith being that we exhibit our faith by what we do, but that, that our, those works don't purchase for us a home in heaven. It is the free gift of God. So, it is because what has God has done perfectly through Christ who has done perfectly that we are saved. We can put our faith in Christ and God to do it perfectly because we can't do it perfectly. Okay. We can't put our faith. And so our faith in Christ and the Father to save our souls is what saves us. We can't save ourselves, and we can't become more perfect to earn more heaven. That's not the point. So th what am I saying? What is the motivation for our growing in the, in the Lord, growing closer to God, growing in knowledge, and thereby growing in grace? It's not to earn heaven or a bigger piece of heaven, get a bigger piece of real estate in heaven. It's to glorify God. And our salvation is intact. Our salvation is sure because God has promised it. As long as we continue to walk in the light, continue to confess our sins to the Father, that He will continue to forgive us our sins. So, I've dealt with a couple of topics tonight. One is some of the, the, the uh, uh, roadblocks that a, a young Christian might face, or any Christian for that matter might face. But also some reasoning about might help us to continue in the faith, never becoming weary, knowing that our salvation is not reliant solely upon us, in one sense, it is, but in another sense, it really is relying upon the salvation that's been provided by our Father in heaven, that he's done the work, and it's, we rely upon him to hide our souls. Okay. And with that, we can be refreshed and feel, um, uh, what a relief, what a, what a burden taken off our shoulders, realizing that I've got to continue to learn, I need to continue to grow spiritually in order to go to heaven. Well, no. But, yes, too, because we can never rest on our laurels. We can never say we've arrived, and we would want to grow in knowledge and want to grow in the faith and want to grow closer to our Father because he loves us, and in doing so, we glorify him. Not that we're earning more in heaven, but he, that uh, we belong there. In obedience to the gospel, we belong in heaven. And that's where we're heading if we're faithful to him, we're walking in the light. It's a lot of concepts that draw closely together, tied together. That, uh, but uh, when we take the attitude that God has paid the price for us, he's paid the price we couldn't pay, he has done what we couldn't do, he made salvation available to us. It takes a load off of us to realize that we don't have to be sinlessly perfect. I don't mean that we ought not 
avoid sin, that we ought not tailor our, our attitudes and, and edit our, our speech, or that we ought not show love toward the brethren or, or everyone else. That's what I'm saying. But the realization that our salvation is secured because of Christ and the Father means we can sure, it, it's, it's, it's a, a comforting thought that we don't have to perform. We do perform in the sense that we, it, we grow closer to the Father. But, but our salvation rests upon the faithfulness of God and Christ. Now, as we, we uh, conclude the sermon tonight, we, as always, we give the gospel invitation that because of what God has done, sending his son, what Christ has done upon dying on the cross, shedding his blood, he's, he's purchased salvation for us. He died for all men, but only those who believe on Christ, confess him and repent of their sins, and are baptized for remission of sins shall have that promise, shall receive that gift of God, and that obedience, one obtains that gift. As Peter was asked on the day of Pentecost, men and brethren, what must we do? He said unequivocally, without hesitation, repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father, in the name, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if you find that you need to obey the gospel and have everlasting life, be forgiven of the Father, then come forward as we stand and as we sing.